All right, YouTube. I want to go over a clip right here with Lex Friedman and a Michael Saylor interview. In this interview, they're talking about cryptos being securities. For the first time, Lex Friedman really, I want to say, stumped Michael Saylor because Michael Saylor kept saying Bitcoin is the only digital property because of this set of criteria. And Lex was kind of grilling him like, well, what makes it fair? Why is it okay that you can promote Bitcoin as a quote unquote property, but somebody else can't promote another cryptocurrency? Like who is actually defining the definition? And this is where Michael Saylor admits that Bitcoin will not be the only digital property. What makes Bitcoin different from other cryptocurrencies? Main selling point is proof of work. Because of how proof of work is structured and how you don't own any rights to the network, the amount of coins that you own, don't dictate what control you have over the network. Very, very important. So I wanna let this clip play and I want you guys to drop comments below and let me know what you think because there's only a few blockchains out there, wink, 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 that meet the same criteria as Bitcoin. Ready? Let's dive deep. If you have a barrel of oil and you're in Ukraine versus Russia versus Saudi Arabia versus the US, you have a barrel of oil, right? And it doesn't matter what the premier in, in Japan or the mayor of Miami Beach thinks about your barrel. They cannot wave their hand and make it not a barrel of oil or a cord of wood, right? And so property is just a naturally occurring element in the universe, right? And well, I use the word ethical, and sorry to, um, I may interrupt occasionally. Why, why ethical assigned to property? Because if it's a security, a security would be an example of a share of a stock or a crypto token controlled by a small team. And, and in the event that something is a security because some small group or some identifiable group can control its nature, character, supply, then, uh, it really only becomes ethical to promote it or sell it pursuant to fair disclosures. So uh, I'll, I'll give you maybe practical example. I'm the mayor of Chicago. I give a speech. My speech, I say, I think everybody in Chicago should own their own farm and have chicken, a, a chicken in the backyard and their own horse and an automobile. That's ethical. I give the same speech and I say, I think everybody in Chicago should buy Twitter stock, sell their house or sell their cash and buy Twitter stock. Is that ethical? Not really. Well, at that point, you've entered into a conflict of interest because what you're doing is you're promoting um, an asset which is substantially controlled by a small group of people, the board of directors or the CEO of the company. So if you know, how would you feel if the president of the United States said, I really think Americans should all buy Apple stock? You would, you know, especially if you worked at Google. Or, but you worked anywhere. You'd be like, why isn't he saying buy mine, right? Uh, a security is, um, is a proprietary asset in some way, shape, or form. The, and the whole nature of securities law, it starts from this ancient, ancient idea, thou shalt not lie, cheat, or steal, okay? Mm -hmm. If uh, I'm going to sell you securities or I'm going to promote securities as a public figure or as an influencer or anybody else, right? If, if I create my own yo-yo coin or Mikey coin, and then uh, there's a million of them, and I tell you that I think that it's a really good thing and Mikey coin will go up forever, right? And everybody buys Mikey coin, and then I give 10 million to you and don't tell the public, right? I, I've cheated them. So do me a favor, drop a comment below. Let me know what you guys think so far. So very interesting. What Michael Saylor is saying here is it's okay for him to promote Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin is making him money when he promotes it because it's ethically and morally all right because Bitcoin is defined as a property. Now, if you take a look at what property is, I look at property like a house, land, that's property. But was Bitcoin property when it first got created? Since the beginning of time, land was property. Your rights to own land, basically you lived on it, you owned it. People decided that Bitcoin was a property. I don't think it was something that naturally it was first created and was like, yep, property, digital property. They've turned it into digital property. And now that they're quote unquote classifying Bitcoin as digital property, it seems like they're trying to make it impossible for anything else to be classified as digital property. No matter how hard they tried to follow the same footsteps that Bitcoin followed, we are getting to a point where technology on this scale can't quote unquote, be considered a property 
it has to be getting considered as good security. And this is why I say that Cadena will not be deemed a security because it shares so many of the same characteristics as Bitcoin. And if there was one crypto out there that will not pass the Howey test, you do not want to pass the Howey test. You want to fail the Howey test. Cadena is one of the only cryptocurrency blockchains out there that even stands a remote chance at failing the Howey test. And Michael Saylor will explain it here in a second. Maybe if if I have Mikey coin and I think there's only 2 million Mikey coin and I swear to you there's only 2 million and then I get married and I have three kids and my third kid is in the hospital and my kid's going to die and I have this ethical reason to print 500,000 more Mikey coin or else people are going to die and everybody tells me it's fine. You know, I've still abused, you know, the investor, right? It, it's it's a ethical challenge. What Michael Saylor meant there for Bitcoin to ever have more than 21 million Bitcoin released out into circulation, in order for that change to take place, there would have to be a hard fork. In order to hard fork the network, you need 51% of the hash power in the network to agree that that's the route you want to go. Because when you fork a blockchain, miners get to decide what chain do they want to mine. They got to pick one. They can't mine them both. So if you get enough of the hash power to move over to one chain or move migrate over to the new chain, what happens? The old chain will die off or the old chain can keep running, but then you have a Bitcoin 2.0 or BTC2 or Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin Gold or, or Bitcoin SV. Those are all forks. Those are forks that try to do their own thing, try to create another version of Bitcoin, try to make Bitcoin better, but it just didn't stick. Bitcoin stayed the same pretty much since inception. Now it's had upgrades, it's had changes, it's had modifications. Bitcoin can change, but not one individual actor can change it. And the amount of coins that you own do not dictate any voting power in the network. Because Michael Saylor owns over 1% of Bitcoin, you would think that he'd have a lot to say with how the Bitcoin network operates, but he doesn't because he doesn't own the hash power. Now, if Michael were to build a ton of farms and acquire all that hash power, sure, he could weigh, have a big vote in the network. And with his clout, he could use his clout to influence people that do own mining farms. Something like Solana, for example. If Solana wanted to double the amount of coins they had out in the circulation, they could easily do that. If Elon Musk, if Solana figures out how to scale and they get their blockchain optimized and it's just perfect, right? And they put all this work in there. If any one person, I wanna say owns 33% of coins on a proof of stake chain, they can dictate where the network goes. Just like Elon Musk bought Twitter, and force the Twitter board out, Elon Musk could do that with a, any proof of stake chain. He just needs to acquire enough tokens to control the majority vote. And then he can change anything he wants in that blockchain. But what characteristics do we wanna see in a blockchain that deems it a property versus a security? Ethics laws um, everywhere in the world, uh, they all boil down to having a clause which says that if you're a public figure, you can't endorse any a security you can't endorse something that would cause you to have a conflict of interest so if you're a mayor a governor a country a public figure an influencer and you want to promote or promulgate or support something using any public influence or funds or resources you may have it needs to be property it can't be security so it goes beyond that, right? I mean, like, would the Chinese want to support an American company, right? As soon as you look at what's in the best interest of the human race, the civilization, you realize that if you want an ethical path forward, uh, it needs to be based on common property, which is fair. And the way you get to a, a common property is through an open permissionless protocol. If it's not open, right, if it's proprietary and I know what the code says and you don't know what the code says, that's that makes it a security. Taking a look at blockchains like Quant, HBAR, right? Both of them have their own proprietary software that is locked that nobody can see the code behind. If it's uh, permissioned, if you're not allowed on my network or if you can be censored or booted off my network, that also makes it a security. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about uh, property, I mean, the challenge here is how do I create something that's equivalent to a barrel of oil in cyberspace? Uh, and that means it has to be a, a, a non-sovereign bearer instrument, open, permissionless, not censorable. If I could do that, then I could deliver you 10,000 dematerialized barrels of oil and you would take 
settlement of them and you would know that you have possession of that property irregardless of the opinion of any politician or any company or anybody else in the world. That's a, a really critical characteristic and it's probably one of the fundamental things that makes Bitcoin special. B Bitcoin isn't just a crypto asset network. It's easy to create a crypto asset network. It's very hard uh, to create an ethical crypto asset network because you, ha you have to create one without any government or corporate corporation or investor exercising into influence to make it successful. And what's really fortunate for the Bitcoin maxis, right? And now that Bitcoin's created, they're looking at Bitcoin going, okay, if everybody does A, B, and C, exactly what Bitcoin did, then they can be deemed not a security. But you guys haven't laid out any groundwork. So many great crypto products have launched over the last three to four years that may be deemed a security. But if there was a clear set of rules and guidelines that they knew that they had to follow that would have made them not a security, how many of these projects would have followed those rules? If there are no rules, I can quote unquote, technically say that you're breaking something. You're not following them because there are no rules to follow. So open, permissionless, non-censorable. So basically no way for you without explicitly saying so, outsourcing control to somebody else. So it's a kind of, you have full control. Even with a barrel of oil, um, is it, what's the difference in between a barrel of oil and a Bitcoin to you? What is the, because you kind of mentioned that both are property. Is, uh, you mentioned Russia and China and so on. Is is it the ability of the government to confiscate? In the end, governments can probably confiscate no matter what the asset is, but you want to lessen the um, effort involved. A barrel oil is a bucket of physical property, liquid but that's, property, that's and, very and a Bitcoin is a, a digital property. But it's easier to confiscate a barrel of oil. It's than, easier to than, confiscate things in the real world than things in cyberspace. Much easier. So that's not universally true. Some things in the digital space are actually easier to confiscate because just the nature of how things move easily with information right so i think in the bitcoin world what we would say is that is that bitcoin is the most difficult property that the human race possesses or has yet invented to confiscate and that's by virtue of the fact that you could take possession of it via your private key so you, you know if you got your 12 seed phrases in your head then that would be the highest form of property right because i literally have to crack your head open and read your mind to take it. it. It doesn't mean I couldn't extract it from you under duress, but it means that it's harder than every other thing you might own. If you, in, in fact, it's exponentially harder. If you consider every other thing you might own, a car, a house, a share of stock, gold, diamonds, property rights, intellectual property rights, movie rights, music rights, anything imaginable, they would all be easier by orders and orders of magnitude to seize. So that uh, so digital property in the form of a you know a, a, a set of private keys is by far the apex property of the human race. In terms of ethics, I want to make one more point. It's like I might say to you, Lex, I think Bitcoin is the is the best, most secure, most durable crypto asset network in the world. Is going to go up forever, and there's nothing better in the world. I might be right. I might be wrong, but the point is because it's property, it's ethical for me to say that if I were to turn around and say, you know, Lex, this, I think the same about micro strategy stock, MSTR, mm. that's a security. Okay. If I'm wrong about that, I have civil liability or other liability because, because I could go to a board meeting tomorrow and I could actually propose we issue a million more shares of micro strategy stock, whereas the thing that makes Bitcoin ethical for me to even promote is the knowledge that I can't change it. <laughs> if if I knew that I could make it 42 million instead of 21 million and I had the button back here, yeah, right, then, then I have a different degree of ethical responsibility. Now, I could tell you your life will be better if you buy Bitcoin and it might not. You might go buy Bitcoin, you might lose the keys and be bankrupt and your life ends and your life is not better because you bought Bitcoin, right? right but it wouldn't be my ethical liability any more than if i were to say lex i think you ought to get a farm i think you should be a farmer mm -hmm. i think a chicken in every pot you should get a horse i think you'd be better i mean these are all uh they're all um 
opinions expressed about property, which may or may not be right, that you may or may not agree with, but in, in a legal sense, if we read the law, if we understand securities law, and I would say, you know, most people in the crypto industry, they didn't take companies public. And so they're not really focused on the securities law. They don't even know the securities law. If you focus on the securities law, that would say you just can't legally sell this stuff to the general public or promote it without a full set of continuing disclosures signed off on by a regulator. So uh, there's a fairly bright line there with regard to securities. When you get to the secondary issue, it's how do you actually build a world based on digital property if public figures can't embrace it or endorse it? You see, so you're not going to build a better world based upon Twitter stock if that's your idea of property, because Twitter stock is a security and Twitter stock is never going to be a non-sovereign bearer instrument in Russia, right? Or in China, right? It's not even legal in China, right? So it's not a global permissionless open thing. It will never be trusted by the rest of the world. And legally it's impractical, but you know, would you really want to put $100 trillion worth of economic value on Twitter stock if there's a board of directors and a CEO that could just get up and like take half of it tomorrow? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. If you, want to, if you want to build a better world based on digital energy, you need to start with constructing a digital property. Taking a look at Kadena, when was the Kadena project started? In 2016. When was the first time you heard anybody talk about Kadena? 2019. So for three years, Kadena existed. Nobody promoted it. Nobody talked about it. Nobody influenced it. For three years from inception, Bitcoin's inception was 2009. When was the first time you guys seen videos of people promoting Bitcoin? Guys were going out and buying billboards saying now accepting. Watch the Bitcoin documentary. It's really mind blowing. This one dude pretty much put Bitcoin on the map by promoting it. Taking a look at Kadena, never was promoted, never was talked about for almost three years. Looking back at the charts, I don't know when the first time Kadena was actually sold. Seems like it was started in the United States, but I don't recall anybody buy, selling, or trading any Kadena for years. Never thought about that. Wow, I wonder, I wonder, that's something to look into. Kadena is proof of work. No one person owns it. The amount of coins that you own don't dictate what happens to the network. It is proof of work but it is Blake 2S algorithm. Bitcoin uses SHA-256. Blake, quantum resistant. Bitcoin, not quantum resistant. Bitcoin is my second biggest holding. I absolutely love Bitcoin. I'm just trying to have a conversation because I think the industry needs it. You also have politicians, regulators, making laws that dictate what is quote unquote deemed a digital property. And the number one thing that the Bitcoin maxis talk about is a free market. We need to have a free market. That's what Bi that's what Bitcoin represents is a free market. Well, if Bitcoin represents a free market, why are the maxis in Congress trying to testify, trying to get regulators and politicians to make laws that makes it harder for there to be, to be a free market? So we got politicians and we got Bitcoin maxis lobbying for regulations and those regulations make it not a free market, not a fair market. Crypto right now is a fair market. It's as fair as it can get outside of the fact that now laws and regulations are forcing people to KYC. Now that we all have to KYC, it's no longer a fair market. We had a fair crypto market. You only buy so many rug pulls. <laughs> you only get wiped out and wrecked so many times before you really learn, maybe I shouldn't invest in shit coins, right? I don't need any regulations. I didn't need any, go I didn't need anybody to protect my money. I'm a grown adult. We're all grown adults. It is everybody's own responsibility to do their own research, understand the investments that they're making before they make them. Because if they don't, they're only gonna make a few before they realize that they need to do those things, right? So it's cool. I just wanted to have this cool conversation with you. I love Bitcoin. I do think that a lot of these proof of stake chains, the way that they are structured, right? That makes sense to be a security, right? If one person dictates what the protocol can do, if your blockchain breaks and a few people can turn it back on and turn it back off, <clears throat> the only proof of stake cryptocurrency that I really see trying to go the extra mile and quote unquote, be a decentralized proof of stake blockchain is Cardano. I think if there's one blockchain that's went above and beyond out of all other areas that they failed at, Cardano. And what Charles Hodgkins is doing, and what Charles is doing is he's building, or he gave a big grant, or he built a bridge, or he built a, he built a bridge. Charles built a bridge on, on Harvard University. I don't know what university it is. Someone in Washington or Colorado University or something like that. 
where he's basically going to fund the department to do research and create a standard which classifies how decentralized something is based off a set of criteria that everybody can abide to or the majority agree upon. So doing it in an open source, decentralized way, getting it peer reviewed and creating a standard for decentralization. In order to fail a Howey test, that shit's so old and outdated. Although it's been working and it does what it needs to do, it's old, it's bullshit. We're in a completely new industry. We're creating a new market. Crypto is a new emerging market. Crypto is an emerging market. So when you have a new market, to just go and take old rules and apply them to that just doesn't make sense. I agree with regulations, but I also don't agree with the fact that so many other cryptocurrencies out there should be qualified as not securities as long as they meet a set of criteria. But that same set of criteria should be held up. Nobody knows if Satoshi sold, if he had two wallet addresses, nobody knows who Satoshi was. So to say that Satoshi's never sold a Bitcoin is just not true. You cannot prove that. But the fact that he's remained anonymous is great. It's, it's amazing. But the technology that has evolved to where it is now, Satoshi could have not built Kadena by himself, period. It's just way too advanced. It's superior to everything else in the industry. And that's why I say Bitcoin and Kadena will be brother and sister. Bitcoin will be your store of value. With the Lightning Network, maybe you can do 300,000 transactions per day. Bitcoin is only capable of doing 300 or 350,000 transactions per day. There are 6,000 tweets per second. So if you were just trying to put something like tweets on a blockchain to give transparency, in 50 seconds, the Bitcoin blockchain would be at max capacity. So to think that Bitcoin could operate even with layer twos, if those layer twos are using the layer one for settlement, be very, very interesting to see how that's actually taking place. Drop some comments below. Let me know what you guys think. Love you guys.